try and uh, do some workarounds. Our Wi-Fi is in and out. Um, so just, just to give you a heads up on that. Um, I'm Danita, I'm one of the worship leaders. It's so good to have you here. Um, our online guests, it, things might look a little differently because our Wi-Fi isn't working, but hopefully you can still um, you can still see everything that you need to see. And if something goes out, we're sorry. We're doing our best. Um, if you are new, there are connection cards in front of you um, in the seats. We would love to just hear from you, who you are, let us know. We'd love to connect. Um, if everybody could just stand right now then. As we take a deep breath in, remember why we're here. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for meeting us here every single week. Um, I'm thankful that we don't have to have fancy technology and working Wi-Fi to worship you. Um, thank you that uh, heaven comes down and reaches us and speaks to us in, in this space. We ask your Holy Spirit to speak to our hearts, speak to those leading today, um, that, that everybody here may, may hear what it is you have to say to us. In your name, amen. So you notice we're a little thin up here. We got some people sick. I have people out. So that means that y'all are going to have to sing today, okay? Because um, you're going to have to fill the space. Because just have my keyboard and just have some voices, okay? So I'm like, and the first couple songs I picked are kind of full. So I need you all to sing, okay? Okay. You know what you got to do. Thank you. 
categorical plea, for we are listening and watching. We know you hear us and answer us. Through suffering and battle, you do not leave us who are right at our side. While difficulty may be great, you are greater, O God. As for me, I call to God, and the Lord saves me. Evening, morning, and noon, I call and hear my voice, also strengthening me through relationships with others. Join us together, O oh God. We, we listen, we watch, and we look to you as the one who redeems and rescues us.
Lord, Savior, our friend, we praise you this morning because you are good. We are so thankful that you promised to be in this space with us and to bring your goodness and your joy. So there is joy in the house of the Lord tonight. We pray as we uh, as we hear your words this morning, as we continue to sing together and pray together and, and partake in communion together, that we would feel your presence, your friendship, your love for us, and your goodness. Help us to be a body that reflects your love and light as we move through today and this week, and bless us as we're here in this space together. Amen. You may take a seat. Thank you all so much for being here this morning. Um, my name is Olivia. Um, I'm the family ministry director here, and I'm getting to welcome our, our guest pastor today. So it's a bit of a homecoming this morning for Pastor Steve Grover. He comes to us. You can read his bio. He comes to us through um, a, a long list of, of Nazarene credentials that makes him qualified, and I'm excited to hear him speak today. But he was the pastor here at Table Life for about 30 years, so if you that if you've met him before, it's a homecoming and it's new, he'll feel like one of the family. Um, and so, yeah, but I do want to say, I did say it to your highlights, and I, I do want to highlight that you do have five grandchildren, which I'm sure is a highlight of your life, sir. That's the important part. Just want to catch his face. <laughs> uh, so please help me welcome Pastor Grover. Unless you're one of the kids, then you're coming back with me to the big room to do kids' table together. Talked to us. 
My parents taught me how to eat. Certain practices of personal hygiene. Manners for courtesy. They tried to teach me how to get along with my sister. <laughs> if they could only see us now, they would be surprised and be blessed. <laughs> Most of us went to school where we were taught the basic R's. Are you ready? Reading, writing, and arithmetic. All right, you catch on real quick. Very good, thank you so much. Yeah. Scripture teaches us that Jesus grew in wisdom. Does that mean there was a point as an infant he still had to learn? We also read in scripture that he learned patience through what he suffered. I wish there was a school you could go to and they would just sort of download patience. But you still got to learn to use it. He learned it through what he Suffered. Welcome to life. This suggests that many of the basic characters and behaviors of Jesus were taught to him by Mary, his birth mother, Joseph, his stepfather, neighbors of Nazareth, and synagogue teachers. He had to learn all that. As we look at the life of David, we find an interesting source of his training as a soldier, a leader, and ultimately, a king. That source was Jonathan, the son of the first king of Israel, King Saul. These two men, David and Jonathan, became very close friends. Stories of this life-shaping friendship can be found in chapters 18 through 23 of 1 Samuel. Uh, question was asked, what's my text? And I thought, well, there's all kinds of chapters, and we don't have time to get down to one of them. So I encourage you to take time to, to read that. Um, it, these stories illustrate the basic behaviors for cultivating life-shaping friendships. This morning, I, I, I see key five aspects of the development of this friendship that shaped David as a king. Oh, we realize that God did a lot of that, but he was working through. And, and I want you to see these, these five elements that I have defined. The first one that I see is the cultivation of David as a king starts with the work of God. God cares for you and me. You got that? As you look at the story of David, and as Pastor Chris has shared in a couple of our sermons so far, God directed the prophet Samuel to anoint this shepherd boy to be king. That was quite a story. It was not an election or an application process. No political parties to work your way through. Not a common right to being king or to office as the eldest son of the king. God was doing God's work. David was God's selection and appointment. As I think of this, I'm reminded of an old phrase, God equips those whom he calls. Did you say that? God equips those whom God calls. God doesn't just download computer style program. He shapes us through life. I've had the privilege of watching several people come into different types of ministries, lay ministries, ordained ministries, whatever. And, and you realize, and, and, and the first phrase of most everyone, when they hear this sense of I'm being called as me, not me. I'm not what was the word we used? I'm not able. I'm not. God equips those whom God calls. Now, one of the first things we see in the story is that God opened the eyes of Jonathan to see something special about this shepherd boy. 
I try to put some of these in, in the worship page that you have inside of your worship folders, and then you can fill in the blanks. But first is just see. Jonathan saw this shepherd boy defeat a Goliath. You watch. It would be nice to know what was going on in his brain that day. He later saw David's participation in battle with the armies of Israel against the Philistines. And he began to see. God works through what we see and he opens our eyes to see unique opportunities that are in for us. He also began to see the respect of soldiers for David. What's a good sign of a leader? People are following. If you think you're a leader but nobody's following, there's something missing. Right? People are following. So God opened the eyes of, of Jonathan to see something special about this shepherd boy. Didn't take long. The third thing you want to see is that Jonathan befriended David and began cultivating David's abilities. He gave David his sword and his tunic. Tunic had something like you know forms today with badges and whatever else. But, but the soldiers were following David. And so Jonathan gave him. Now, it was a long way from that sling that Pastor Chris so aptly described last week. He began to teach him how to use those weapons. And had to be learned by David. But there's another part about this befriending David. Jonathan had to set aside temptation to jealousy. He had to set aside feelings that it should have been him, the son of the king, whom the soldiers would follow into battle. He had to set aside jealousy. He had to overcome pride drive for power, position. He had to come over that. Those, those are natural responses in life for us. That's my right. That's my place. That's where I should be. Or, of course, I the other side, say, somebody else should do it. Third thing was, Jonathan began to befriend David. Through that time, Jonathan began to see that David would be the successor of, of his father as king. He began to see it. Something was happening. He also saw his father's perception and jealousy of David. A successful soldier that other soldiers were admiring. A man who would succeed him as king, a position Saul wanted to hand over to his son, Jonathan. Things got a little hairy about that time. The writer of First Samuel records several instances in which Saul tried to kill David. He didn't just automatically get crowned king. He had to grow. He had to deal with forces of opposition, primarily of his own father. But as Jonathan and David began working together, as Jonathan began to see over time, that's what I want you to see, it, over time, it didn't happen immediately. I don't think there's a point for which God said, by the way, Jonathan, this is what's going to happen. Over time, he began to see the hand of God at work. And the fourth item I wanted to see is Jonathan began to see over time that David would be the successor. He saw his father's perception and jealousy of David, a successful soldier, admiration, but a man who would succeed him as king, a position he wanted to hand over to his son Jonathan. That takes us to the fifth observation. Jonathan and David over time became 
friends who were loyal to each other. Developed. They became friends. Jonathan began to speak up for and defended David before his own father. A particular story in this defense uh, by Jonathan is found in the 20th chapter of 1 Samuel. It was time for the new moon festival. And the king was putting on this great big feast and uh, for his major government leaders. And he expected David to attend. But David chose not to attend. Doesn't say why, I don't know whether he didn't want to test it or there was hesitancy, but he told Jonathan he, would, he was going to go celebrate with his family. This triggered Saul's jealousy. And, and in that 20th chapter, 28, again, the 28th verse, you, you see a, a just a, an angry outburst of, of Saul. Where is that guy at? He's supposed to be here. Jonathan tells him. Jonathan defends him. Jonathan speaks up for him. Saul is so angry, he calls on his government leaders to take every step necessary to kill David. He puts out the challenge. Pretty well tells Jonathan off. You son of a perverse woman. Can you imagine that kind of a comment about your own son? That's how ugly the scene had gotten. After the feast was over, Jonathan and David meet. The previously planned spot. Jonathan expresses Saul's anger. And then Jonathan says to David in verse 42, Go in peace, for we have sworn friendship with each other in the name of the Lord, saying, The Lord is witness between you and me and between your descendants and my descendants forever. Friendship with loyalty and trust is a relationship that is cultivated through the events of life. It takes time, effort, vulnerability to develop a close friendship. It's cultivated through common interests, goals, and purpose. In my 40 plus years of ministry, I have developed some of those friends, but it takes time. You see, a friend is a person who knows enough about me to destroy me, but won't. That's a friend. Throughout my ministry, I've often encountered people who were frustrated because they couldn't find a friend. Now, what's the difference? Making a friend, finding a In this story, Jonathan took the initiative and reached out to David. But there's another part of this. David responds with acceptance. Sadly, Jonathan and his father, Saul, were both killed in a battle with the Philistines. And that story is recorded in 1 Samuel chapter 31. The depths of that friendship between David and Jonathan is reflected a little bit later in 2 Samuel. It's seen in the lamentation of Jonathan's death, uh, found in chapter 1, verse 26. Uh, paraphrased by Eugene Peterson in the message this way, Oh, my dear brother Jonathan, I'm crushed by your death. Your friendship was a miracle wonder, far exceeding anything I know and ever hope to know. The death of friendship, the song that came with it. Chapters 2 through 5 of 2 Samuel tells about the coronation of, of David as king over Israel. But in, in chapter 9, we, we find another story. David wants to find out if there is a descendant of Jonathan still alive. And there was a boy that had been dropped as an infant and was, was crippled in his feet. David called him. To the palace room. And there David restored all the property 
that King Saul had owned to Mephibosheth. That's what he did. Not only did he give him that, he assigned the servants who had worked with Saul, taking care of the property, property to work with Mephibosheth and take care of that property for him. He was making room for care. And he also provided a place at his own table for Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth. I can't even say it. <laughs> Providing a place for Jonathan's son for the rest of his life. A place of royalty. If you recall ancient practices, the children and relatives of the succeeding king had to be killed and not the David. He honors the son of, the, of, of Jonathan. This friendship between Jonathan and David was a key factor in the development of David as a king of Israel. I want you to notice the evolution of this friendship, and it might be a little hard from the distance you're at, but first there was just getting acquainted. You never know who you're going to encounter when you get acquainted. You just never know. There was respect for David by Jonathan, this shepherd boy. There was respect. He began to see something special. Then there was the effort by Jonathan to equip David for future battles. There was a growing, I want you to hear this, a growing awareness of potential in David as a military leader and possibly a king by Jonathan. The sacrifice that is perceived, sacrifice of personal rights, expectations by Jonathan. He saw what was going to happen. And his choice was to help David be the leader God wanted him to be. And along with this, it was an important one. It was the acceptance of the ministry of Jonathan by David. I want you to see that. He accepted it. He opened to the people to come along and are becoming a help to you. Finally, there was a growing relationship as they worked together. As I reflected on this story, I was drawn to another unique story, this time in the life of Jesus, a story of friendship. We read how Jesus recruited a team of disciples whom he would equip for extending a new expression of the kingdom of his father, the church. In their journeys, he taught them a new understanding of the law. It wasn't just observing Sabbath and doing things like that. There was something different. And, and, and John records this in chapter 13. I am new command I give you, Jesus taught, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples. If you love one another. It was a new way that Jesus taught to those disciples. He, he, Jesus illustrated a life of gracious ministry and revealed new perceptions of the kingdom of God that would shape their ministries following his resurrection and ascension to heaven. John, St. John records an interesting development of the relationship between Jesus and his disciples. It's found in chapter 15, verse 15. Jesus says to them, I, I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know what his master's business is. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything I have learned from my father, I have made known to you. The New Living Translation and King Eugene Peterson's paraphrase of this is Jesus says, Now I tell you. Now, wait a minute. They've been together for three years, they've been traveling together. They've been dealing with opposition. They've gone through all kinds of things together. But if you listen back and go to the story, how do the disciples usually refer to Jesus? Master, rabbi, teacher. In an ancient setting, that 
designated a servant. Jesus would have been the master, his teacher. It was a teaching, learning, teacher, student relationship. But Jesus says to them over these three years, now I call you friends. If he had only, well, he did know what was going to happen over the next few hours. But notice what Jesus does with these friends after his resurrection. He goes to them. He remembers them. He restores them. He equips them. He prepares them for the next journey. And after, their, after his ascension, after Pentecost, filled with the Holy Spirit, they would become the leaders of that new expression of God's kingdom. We now know as the church. Jesus was calling them as friends to love one another and carry on his ministry. But lest we forget this spiritualized, this avoid spiritualizing this friendship with Jesus as simply a spiritual relationship. Recall a teaching of the Apostle Paul in his letter to the Ephesians to the church in chapter 4, beginning with verse 11. So Christ himself gave various gifts to the church to equip his people for works of service so that when you catch, when, see that phrase so that hang on to that that usually means something there, there's a purpose why did Jesus do it so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and until we all become mature attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheme. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow. Grow what? Oh. To become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself in love, each, just as each part does its work. Building one another up. Developing friendships. Encouraging one another. Equipping one another. Until we all reach unity. I think we spent a lot of time there. In the knowledge of Jesus. And until we all become mature. And what's the sign of maturity? The likeness of Jesus. Oh, there's a debate whether the five categories of appointments refer to five types of ministerial leadership for the church as a whole, apostles, prophets, etc. Or whether all believers are gifted and called to one of those types of ministries. You see, the key for us is not which line of thinking Paul intended, but the purpose of these five categories, to equip God's people, to equip one another for works of service, so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God, and until we all become mature, attaining to the, this next phrase blows my mind, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness. The whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Friends, every believer is called to a ministry of edifying or building up fellow believers, of being a Jonathan to one another. We're all called to that. We all have that. You don't have to have a special gifting for that. Just be a friend. Open your eyes. Recall the place of friendship of Jonathan in the development of David. Recall the growth of the relationship between Jesus and his disciples. Friendship. 
the ministry identified St. Paul is built within relationship of friends. You may not be that stage yet. But are you open to that kind of development? Friendship is a stronger form of interpersonal bond than an acquaintance or an association. It is a relationship of mutual affection between people that's developed in life. A holy friendship is a unique friendship that shapes and cultivates our lives as common believers in Jesus and ministers of the gospel of Jesus in this world. I'm sure you've heard it many times, and you heard it many times while I was here. Dear friend, if you're a believer today, you are a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Do you know that? You are. The question is, what's the location? Common questions for this type of message often is, well, who is someone God is prompt prompting you to befriend? Well, that's a fair one uh, that you could be open to. Who is it Jonathan God has brought into your life to cultivate your relationship with God and your gifts of ministry in the name of Jesus to others? It may be someone you don't even realize yet. But here's what I ask you to do instead today. Through your faith in God, ask the Holy Spirit to open your eyes to see the people you encounter. Important. Not only open your eyes, but open your heart to see the possibilities God has for you and that person you've encountered. I don't want you to go out here and say, okay, I've got to go find A, B, or C. Here, here, here's my request for you today. Be open. The leadership of the Holy Spirit. Allowing the Holy Spirit to open your eyes, to see the people you encounter. Oh, you don't have to tell them what God wants. That's, that, that's, that's a conversation between them and God. But opening them in their eyes. See what God has for them. So with that in mind, let me pray. Lord God, The one who selected a shepherd boy to be king, and through so many people shaped him. We are reminded, of God, that you are God. And I thank you for each person that's here today. The Cable Life Church. We go from here. Open our eyes to see people we encounter. To see the possibilities, to see the potential, but to see and then befriend and take those steps initiating friendship. To see what you have for them. This I pray for. That in mind. Today, we come to the, to the table of the Lord. In a practice that was initiated by him the evening of his evening prior to his crucifixion. And then a meeting with him takes the bread. Broken. Bless me. This is my body broken. What all Jesus went through to bring to us truths of God. 
This is my body. Broken for you. Opening up new doors. And he took the cup. Blessed him. Broken. Blessed it. Passed it among them. All of you. Drink of this. It is my blood poured out for you. It is my life poured out for you. Yes, for the forgiveness of sins. That's a great big stop. But also for the transformation. That new step. The infilling of the Holy Spirit. For the ministry that Jesus has for you. Reflecting on that. Lord God. Thank you for this gracious tradition you have given to us. Thank you, Lord Jesus. You bless the bread and the cup today as we participate. And, and then as we come, Lord, may we be open. we participate, Lord, may we realize your body, your blood, your blessing, and if you are present in these elements, doing your work, we ask them, Lord Jesus, amen. I invite those who can ask to serve to come and take your place. Join together in the prayer of Jesus.
So before we part for the day, uh, let's stand and sing the dots part. 
doxology and praise the Lord. Praise God from whom